wealth is not just about money. Most people are programmed just to work for their money supply. But true wealth is actually our time. We trade away moments of our lives for money, hour by hour, day by day, year by year, instead of getting money to work for us. And that is where we come in. I am Neil Peterson, founder of Real Estate Investor Magazine, author, investor, and real estate communications expert. The question that I have on my mind is, how can we fix the huge wealth gap that we have in the world and in the process also create wealth for ourselves? My vision is to get people to change their views of how they believe that they can create real sustainable wealth for themselves. And I believe that real estate is the vehicle. Investing in real estate is 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. Too many people focus on the mechanical side of investing instead of using more creativity. And as my friend and mentor Dolph Torres says, use the six inches between your head given an inch or two in terms of using your own creativity to invest. So what do we do? We educate and inspire entrepreneurs, business owners, and investors to build personal wealth for themselves and also to become far better investors. We help them to position their businesses, to get their message out there to the market in a much bigger way so that they can make a huge impact and at the end of the day, make more income for themselves. So how do we do it? Well, we do it through sharing insider investment information, content, and great ideas in our magazine in both print and digital formats. I have interviewed and met some of the most influential people in the real estate world so that I can share their failures, their successes, their triumphs, and their philosophies with you. We connect entrepreneurs and investors with some of the greatest experts, professionals, and practitioners from all around the world. And you can access them via our website, our live seminars, our live events, our online training programs, and through our networking events. Real Estate Investor has been around for more than eight years and is now an established authority in the real estate industry from an investment perspective. We have published more than 80 real estate investor magazines. In addition to that, we do a number of residential, commercial, and offshore property guides that come out on an annual basis. Some of the awards include Top Property Features Magazine in 2012 and Best Property Publication in 2013 as awarded by SAPOA. Real Estate Investor has already expanded within Africa to Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. The big question is where to next for Real Estate Investor Magazine? So if you're looking for more in-depth knowledge, inspiration, or if you want to connect with us, then what you should do is register on our website, www.remag.co.za, and subscribe to our free newsletter. Subscribe to the magazine online or in print, or join one of our free webinars. View our videos, whether it's on training, whether it's on interviews for our master investor, or insights on the property market. Attend one of our live events. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. The links are online. We look forward to interacting with you. Prosperous investing. Can I just see by a show of hands, how many people are readers of Real Estate Investor Magazine? Okay, rather, how many do not know the magazine? Anybody? Well, I think, you know, we're going to learn over the next day that, you know, education is knowledge and the application of education um, and utilizing that information to your best. And I think that's really where Real Estate Investor is all about. What I'm really excited about is that I've met so many people in real estate in South Africa and all around the world. And we are independent. We don't belong to a property company or anything like that. We are completely and utterly and totally independent. And the reason is that we can share that information with people all around the world in terms of the different strategies within residential, commercial, and offshore. And I'm not here to give you a pitch about the magazine at all. In fact, I'm here to talk about the future trends in real estate, the good, the bad, the ugly. Now, I'm sure you agree that the messages that came through this morning were not very positive. The news flow out there is not very good. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the future trends in real estate in South Africa and all around the world. So I'm going to start off with the ugly, because that's the nasty stuff that's actually happening out there, which is reality in the world out there. We cannot get away from it. It is reality. And we've spoken about it in depth. We spoke more about the South African economy this morning. But essentially, the world is in a very bothered space right now. We have got an artificial world of so many things which are falling apart. And we just need to look at sort of what's happening in the Gaza Strip, in Syria, um, and, and all these different places which are having effects on world economies. Today, the Scottish are voting to see whether they want to become an independent or not. So all these different things are going to impact markets and real estate markets. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. First of all, the nasty side, what is actually happening on the ugly side. But I'm not going to just leave it there because we can either walk away from here completely and totally depressed, or we can walk away from here with something very specific that each and every one can actually take action on. And that is the objective that I want to achieve. Now, you've all got a magazine. And one of our major stories, we spend a lot of a lot of time on the psychology of investing. And one of the articles at the back is, happiness brings ROI. And too many people are so stuck in the mechanics of what's happening. They've got a, a certain way of operating, and I want to get you out of that. So right, we looked at Robin Williams, and this is the late Robin Williams, OK? And what he says is, you will have bad times, but it will always wake you up to the good stuff you weren't paying attention to. Isn't that so true? We get into this world. We've got our inner world, which is our world, and we've got our outer world, where everything seems to be falling apart if you do watch a lot of television and consume a lot of newspapers, and then, of course, believe that it's all actually happening out there. So essentially, at the end of the day, I'm going to touch up a little bit more on that inner and outer world and how you can deal with it. So if we look what just happened in Lagos, Nigeria, a whole building collapsed. Investments do go wrong. We heard this morning up to 80% of people that invest lose money. Why? Is it bad advice? What is it? Well, there's a number of reasons. I mean, some people, and, and I think it's a bit of a South African culture, what we do in this country, we like to be handheld with so-called qualified people who tell us where we must put our money. We are too scared to take our own decisions because there's lots of experts out there who are hands-off, are not really hands-on. And it's time that we start taking responsibility for ourselves, that we take responsibility. So there's a lot that's going, going on in terms of what we can use so many examples of things that are falling apart. Look at the banking collapse of African Bank. 5.6 billion lost, gone, out of the economy. And they're, they're looking for a bailout. Now in 2008, when Lehman Brothers crashed, OK, there was a US bailout. Now we've got a South African bailout. So there's huge problems out there. There's massive debt that has been put into the market. And some or other way, it has to be accounted for at some particular stage. I can tell you from all the discussions here this morning, there's going to be an exceptional amount of write-offs, which we, we're not going to expect. And banking, per se, I think is in a, in a very sort of troubled position. And I know there's a lot of bankers out there. If you understand the concept of securitization, what it really is, it really is your asset wrapped up with the individual investor in that particular investment that you're using at the end of the day. And I'm not doing it to scare. I'm not doing it to be anti-bank. It's not about that. It's about understanding what securitization is. It makes you think about if you do decide to get a mortgage or get some kind of loan from the bank, that you actually start actually understanding what the concept is. What is behind a mortgage? Essentially, it is to pay the bank forever, as long as you can. Now, if you start using some of the methodologies that Dolph was talking about today, you know, in terms of reversing that psychology, in, in fact, saying to the bank, well, let's reverse this whole thing the other way around. But there are other multiple options. So yes, so we start looking at what's happening here, and it's happened right in our own backyard with African Bank. So we look at what Benjamin Franklin said. And he's on the $100 note. He's on the $100 US bill. And he said this many years ago, many, many moons, and it still applies today. He said, credit is a system whereby a person who can't pay gets another person who can't pay 
to guarantee that he can pay. And that's what the system is built on. It's built on a whole bunch of promissory notes. Since 1970, when Richard Nixon took the dollar off the gold exchange, money became worthless. Cash in pocket is worthless. It is a bunch of promissory notes that's built up on a pile of debt that's sort of securitized on a whole lot of stock exchanges, what have you, as, as real money, disguised. And so this is, this is the problem in the world today. We don't actually realize that once you start getting to understand the concept of what the money and the wealth, and we talk about the Fed Reserve, and we talk about the SA Reserve, I don't think they have any reserve. Because at the end of the day, we are the taxpayers, we are the people that's going to have to sustain those economies. We are the, we are the slaves. Get, 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 get used to it. We are the slaves. So what we're going to start doing is start outperforming the market. We've got to be smarter. We've got to be doing better things. We've got to be taking better action. So litigation is on the increase. Now, in California and the United States, it is the number one most litigious society in the world. I mean, you fall over in the shopping center and you, you get sued. But for the most minuscule thing, you get sued. You know which is the second biggest in the world? Anybody. Sydney, Australia. Same thing. Also American culture. Also type of thing where they start suing you. But I can tell you what, since 2008, since the banking, since we got the world financial crisis, the global financial crisis, we found that litigation was the increase right here in South Africa. The majority of litigation that's happening in this country is via the banks. Now it's interesting, you go, you walk through the bank's doors, to get a loan, and then all of a sudden, you're passed onto an attorney which you don't know is a third party interloper, which you don't know who they are, but they're suing you for money. And then all of a sudden, you've got to pay on the assets. And then we found in the South African courts, it's been proven time and time again, documents get lost. Money's been put into a special purpose vehicle, and it's been unsold. They've already profited from that upfront. Now, I'm not telling that to scare you or to be anti-bank again. What I'm trying to do is you've got to understand. It's documented, it's there, it's out there in the market. I can tell you in 2011, in the South Kateng High Court, 245,000 summonses were served. 245,000. People are saying, well, the only way to do it is to do it through, throw you with a legal piece of paper and, and try and squeeze money, as Benjamin Franklin says, which is not there. It ain't there. And we get into this whole society where we program, get a lawyer, do the thing, do the system, or what have you. And we lose that relationship that we have with money. The bad. What's happening out there? Well, this is a huge bugbear of mine. And it's the inequality in the wealth gap that we have in this country. And it's, getting, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And it's a whole African problem. And, you know, there should be far more people looking at initiatives of affordable housing and trying to get our poverty-stricken people housed. Get them back into the market. That will help us on the top. Instead of just the top layer trying to squeeze each other for nothing that is not there. We need some people, some leaders to step up properly and take action in terms of that. Yesterday there was an announcement, it was on the front cover of the Business Day, where there's an initiative for 3.1 billion in terms of housing in South Africa. There's a massive backlog. It's like two million houses or something. And let me tell you what, we feel it. Let me show you. Oops. Oops. Now tell me, how many of you people have been stuck at a traffic light and you don't actually have any cash on you? You have no money in your pocket. You have absolutely nothing. 
So the story of that, if you actually want to contribute, is that you've got a card. <laughs> this is taken in India. Now, I can tell you, it's coming soon to Africa at a robot close to you, very soon. <laughs> but, you know, we can laugh about it. But, you know, ladies and gents, it's, it's, it's a very, very serious issue. So, you know, once again, we're still on the bad stuff. So we need to get over this thing. So does anybody recognize that property there? Yeah. Cheers. Everybody said, can together. <laughs> wow. And Kandler, of course. I mean, who's paying for it? You are. <laughs> you are. That's your best investment so far. <laughs> so you talk about investing in real estate, that kind of stuff. So this is the kind of thing that's going on. And, you know, coupled with that, we've got dysfunctional municipalities. We've got all these things which are happening out there. And somehow we just have to try and get control and find out ways. I've spoken about the debt. The debt issue is massive. Households are sitting there over, they're literally hanging on the edge of a cliff. I mean, 80% of their income goes towards debt. So you can imagine. And it's not improving in a hurry. So, you know, we've got to find ways of, of dealing with this and how we can get this whole debt thing and becoming better investors and becoming more profitable in what we do and helping each other and helping the system that we can get out of this massive debt trap that we're in. I mean, the US government still $17 trillion in debt. It's, it's, it's just over the top. It's unbelievable how, how large it is. And that, that kind of debt ain't going to disappear. So we, you know, we've talked about you know, these conspiracy theories about implosion and all that different kind of stuff. But we've got to be aware of it when we're investing and when we do take on debt with a bank, for example. Because in 08, you know, you had a pulse, they gave you a loan. And it's changed, and a lot of people were highly geared, they were caught offside, and they're still paying the price today, still today. Now, also the other thing is in terms of due diligence, you know, we've got to become very selective. And I found that that's what's happened with a lot of investors out there, is that they tend to get the wrong property in the wrong place. Now, Dolph mentioned it this morning. You know, it's about, doesn't matter where you are, you know, in the world. In fact, a Tuesday in Johannesburg, we had uh, Amelia Beatty, and Amelia is with Standard, which is a massive asset management company. And they, 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 they're, they're launching into Africa, but they walk the streets. They're trying to find the deals, but the right deal. And we tend to think every single piece of real estate is, 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 is an investment. No, it's not. It's not, because we don't actually know how to do the numbers. And that's what I have found from all my experiences with all the people that I have. There's massive lessons to be learned. There's not a silver bullet for anything, but we've got to go those hard yards and learn them ourselves and make sure that we don't actually do that again. So, you know, and we've got to look at the trends. You know, there's medical facilities, there's, you know, and if you look in America, it's going to be relevant because they've got an aging population. But if you look in Africa, we've got a very young population, so we need to serve that, and it's completely underserved. So, Having said all those things there, all those horrible things that we heard, there is some good out there, ladies and gents, I'm very, very pleased to say. The first thing is the rising of Africa. Now, I can tell you that the seven top countries performing in the world today from a GDP perspective come from Africa. The likes of Ghana, the likes of Ethiopia, the likes of Angola, the likes of Kenya, the likes of Mozambique, and plus a couple of others, they are performing. Africa is completely and totally underserved. We need to find ways of how we can get into Africa from a retail perspective. There's a massive opportunities there. Banking, there's huge opportunity. Telecommunications, roads, all that kind of stuff. They need structural things. So Africa has a massive opportunity, but as we know, it comes with massive risk. And it's those people that are prepared to walk that path on that risk path that tend to get those results. So it's some places where some people say, I don't want to go there. Look what happened in Nigeria. Look at Ebola. Look at all these things that are all around here. They're all affecting the way that we make decisions and whether we should go or not. I don't want to get Ebola. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be affected. So you know, the, that, that could impact on your wealth. So those kind of decisions that you make could impact. Now, the other good story, and I don't know whether it's good, because if you are an estate agent, you would think that there's a property boom out there right now. I can tell you, last week I spoke to Pam Golding. They said in the Atlantic seaboard, they've grown year on year 150%. 150%. Okay, they've had a very lean period over the last six, seven years since the crash. 
But what's driving the market? And I asked that question. I said to, to Andrew, what is actually driving the market? And he said, well, it's a combination of things. There's obviously overseas investors coming from America and from the UK and Germany and uh, Portugal and even Africa, particularly in the Atlantic seaboard. There's no stock. They don't have any stock. And they're all investing in, uh, in, in real estate. Some people, South Africans, who have made a good buck on the stock exchange, taken their money, they decided to put it back into where? Real estate. So, finds that stock market investors also like to real estate as well. So, and it's not necessary, and I think this is a false economy that's been created, because there seems to be a little bit of an uptick, but there's one caveat, and the majority of these deals are all cash. Very little bank lending, particularly in the, in the, in the top end. So that's, that's, that's what we've got to be. There's very little banks which are backing the, the people out there. So I want to bring that point. And, and for some other reason, the estate agents have got a perception that the market is going crazy, that all of a sudden it's back to 05, 06, when things are going exceptionally well. And I don't think so. And I know that Irwin has got a view on that, <laughs> and a very, very powerful view, and something that we will listen to a little bit later. Um, there's also action in the lower markets. In Johannesburg, there's Hyde Park. It's also going through the roof, 70, up 70% in Schlanga, in KZN. Um, so all those areas, there's a massive uptick. But it's, it's all in the 4 million sort of plus market. Now, green. Green is a massive thing that's a, a, impacted the market. Now, green is no longer a tree-hugging concept. Everybody's just saying, no, nah, but it's expensive to go green. It's this and it's that and all that kind of stuff. I can tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, green is part of our lifestyle from the way that we live our life every single day, it's gonna impact us. Just last week at the Green Building Council, they've announced a whole lot of initiatives for residential properties. They've launched a new software tool called Edge, which can manage the way that you actually consume electricity. Now, isn't electricity yet? It's a massive problem. ESCOM have got another 50 billion bailout from the government, another 50 billion. Now, we can, if we don't address that, the energy issue ourselves, and we start saving, and I mean, I bet you, some of you out there are the people that, if you're making a cup of coffee of yourself, you fill up the kettle. How many people do that? <laughs> and you're only making it for yourself. <laughs> and you just think it's something so small. Then of course your rubble, how you separate your rubble. And you know, how you, you know, everything goes to landfill. And all you're doing is, from all the fast foods and all that kind of stuff, I'd like to go to the fast food guys like the McDonald's and what have you. The savings, if they had to serve food on a plate, would be astronomical because all of those packaging stuff goes into landfill and somebody has to do about it. In terms of the commercial market, it's already, there's a, it's, a, it's a million square meters has already been approved for green here in South Africa. They tend to be new buildings. There are some retrofits, in other words, some existing buildings that have been refitted, but it's here to stay. Now, what that's gonna mean for investors is that they're gonna get lower vacancy rates. There's definitely going to be savings for the tenants. And of course, at the moment, tenants are struggling. They're struggling out there in the office market. They really are. So we need to find initiatives and investors, owners, fund managers must take control of this particular and be aware of this green thing and really take it seriously. Okay, so we know that the global stage is our new playground. It's no longer just about South Africa. And, you know, we just have to look at wealth migrates as an example, but we just have to look at what's going on in the stock market. We just, if you look at the top 10 stocks on the JSE, you'd find that the majority of those stocks are all invested not here in South Africa. Definitely not. It's all offshore. So all the income is coming offshore. I'm going to use some examples just now of ones that are ex performing absolutely exceptionally. But you know what they did? They did that 10 years ago already. Do you think they did it last year? Last week, lot, no, no. This is a long-term game. And this is where we're gonna start thinking in terms of long-term. So the global stage is our new playground. We've got new concepts for investing in residential real estate without using the bank called rent to buy So there are all these wonderful ways and means that you can actually invest in real estate without using the bank. And it, once again, it's using that creativity of yours. We tend to get, oh, I've got a property, I can't get finance, I need to get a loan, you know, that kind of thing, I need to get a mortgage. Now we've got new things that like crowdfunding have come on, have come on board. So there's a whole lot of different 
new things that have come onto the market of which rent to buy is also going to impact the real estate market. So I would say crowdfunding, and I would say also rent to buy. The digital age is here. Now, I come, my background is actually in a media company. In fact, as the fly crows there, I'm going to touch a little bit about it, Naspas, um, they have transformed into an absolutely complete, total digital company. When I was at that company, they had major print titles like Report Newspaper, they had Burger and Built and Heiskanut and You and Drum and Sorry and Women's Day and all those wonderful magazines which, which brought in 30% of their income while DSTV brought in most of the rest. They've now gone into 52 countries and they really did that when Chris Becker came on board. 93% of their income comes from offshore. 93, and all that 93, it's all digital. Everything, it's digital. They've transformed that business from the gray shoe brigade, the gray suit brigade, into a digital business that is global. Okay, I'm gonna to touch on a little bit about that because there are people which are making massive difference who are South African offshore, and I want you to start thinking about it. We've spoken about crowdfunding. And I really do think this is going to impact the market. I'm not going to talk too much about it because Scott will do that. I really think that crowdfunding is going to impact. The success of a lot of these international guys at the moment is astronomical. The fundraising that they're doing and at the cost of what they're doing and in terms of the fundraising. So if you had to decide between different vehicles, different funds and what have you, and you looked at the economies of scale, you're going to see crowdfunding is definitely going to come out tops. The other trend that's impacting us is the rise of China and India. We've heard about that all the time. But you know what's also a very interesting statistic? You know which country is going to have the biggest population in 2030? Anybody has it a guess? Anybody? India. There are more babies being born per hour in India than anywhere in the world. And by 2030, they're going to be the biggest population on this planet. Two billion babies. Whew, I think that's just in Africa. I think it's even more than in, in India. I think it's double that. It's an incredible astronomical number. We've got to be able to see the shift in demographics and what's happening in the world. Who's going to look after them? You know, this planet of ours where we've got green and all that, if you don't do it, it's got to become a mindset. We don't invest properly. We don't put proper facilities, don't have proper roads, don't have proper buildings. We're going to implode. We're going to fall apart. So we really have to start thinking of what's happening globally and also as investors where we can get opportunities in those different markets. These are the different companies up here. Now, the number one company, if you talk about technology in the world, is Google. Uh, it's followed by Amazon and then eBay. And you notice there's a new one on top there. It's called Tencent. Do you know that Tencent is the fourth biggest technology company in the world? They're a 150 billion US dollar company. They surpassed Facebook in April 2012 and bigger, they're bigger than Facebook. But you know what the real difference is? You know who's investing in them? We're the Clove Friars, South Africa. They did it 12 years ago. NASPAS owns about 40%, and that's why they could deliver to their shareholders this kind of thing. They're growing at an astronomical rate, and so is technology. Technology is moving in a direction. If you don't embrace technology, I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, today, you're going to die. And as Chris Becker said, the chairman of NASPAS, he says, if you can't beat them, join them. All the new technology in the world is getting created by people that are under 30 years old. So fact. What's going to be the next Google? What's going to be the next Twitter? The next Facebook? We don't know. But what we have to do is the existing technology that is out there, we're going to have to use it to our best effect. Because if we don't, we're going to be in trouble.
Can anybody tell me, um, you know, in gamification, it's also a massive growing industry. Can anybody tell me who are the consumers of that? Anybody? Has it a guess? It's actually women 40 years plus. <laughs> women 40 years plus who are Candy Crush, Candy Crush, and all the games that you get. So now what you're starting to do is if you want to start targeting a specific demographic, and you want to reach those particular females in a 40 plus, you better you know, come up with some kind of gaming app. So the way that you reach them is really to engage them and to talk to them and to get them involved with you, is, it, it's changed. So what I'm going to do in closing, I'm going to give you five ways to capitalize on the trends. Because we've spoken about all these things. We've spoken about the ugly, we've spoken about the, the bad and, and the good. So I want to give you some sort of practical things. And I alluded to this earlier on. You know, the control of your mindset is just so important. You know, the habits that you do, that you get up every single day in a certain way, out the same side of the bed and that kind of stuff, and you switch on the TV and you see a building has collapsed in Lagos, Nigeria, and the world is falling apart and economies are suffering, there's war in, on the Gaza and Syria, North Korea has attacked South Korea, all these different kind of things are, are possibilities that you could wake up on any particular morning. But it's so important to control your inner world and how we react to that. Because what's happening out in that world, we tend to immediately affect our inner world. Because if we consume enough bad media, it's going to have an effect on our inner world. And it's so important that we're in the right headspace from an inner world perspective all the time to make the right decisions, all the different things that we need to make on a day-to-day -day basis in our business. So I just want to talk about all these things and, 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 and try and get that message across that it's so important. Now, in the magazine Real Estate Investor, right at the back, happiness increases ROI. They've actually given some ideas how you can do that and, and the things you can actually apply. So I'm suggesting that have a look, and it's so important. The next thing, we've spoken about the emergence of the smart consumer. We need to recognize it. If you can't beat them, join them. Find a way. Find a way that you can get your message out there. I know some people say, oh, I hate technology. I don't want to use technology. I'm not interested in Twitter. I don't want to go on Facebook. You don't have to, but just find one technology, find one thing, just one thing and try it, and use it for your business, for your own effect, to advance your business, to advance yourself, to make a difference out there. The next thing is in success and failure. I mean, you know, there's so many, you know, there's so many people out there that are, that are saying they're multimillionaires, they've made so much money and what have you. So well, what did you learn from that? And in many cases, you learn nothing. You learn more from your failures, and I can tell you that when World War II, in fact, it was when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. The day, the day that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Warren Buffett bought stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, isn't that counter-cyclical in terms of a mindset? When there's absolute failure out there, there's massive opportunity. And we just have to get our mind across that in terms of that. Now, this morning, it is always depressing to listen to the reality of it. And it's, a, and it's a fact. We cannot take away. We, we cannot take away the fact that there is all these things happening out there. But it's so important how we respond to it. And that's really, we don't react. I mean, I say we're going to run and wherever we're going to do, we're going to go to back for Perth or whatever it may be. That doesn't apply anymore because there's a lot of unrest all around the world. 
The other thing is, and I know it's quite a daunting concept for a lot of people, but it's specifically in Africa and China, and, and if you're going into the Eastern markets, you're going to have to start collaborating with governments. And, you know, governments do have a lot of power. Yes, I know a lot of them are not sending out good signals out there at the moment. But it's going to become, if you want to expand and grow your business, we're going to have to start working with them to find ways and means. So if we want to do an affordable housing project of some kind, we're going to have to get some of the housing departments involved at some other particular stage. We cannot do it without them. We just have to. So we've got to find ways of learning the culture, of engaging with them, interacting with them, and making a difference. And yes, there's knowledge out there. There's so much knowledge. And it's all available for free online. And yet so many people tend to take their broker, or this one, and that one. I'm an expert. I've been in this business for 20 years. So show me your results. Show me what you've done. And there's a lot of savvy investors out there, and a lot of people losing money. But there's, you know, and we've got to kind of get that fine line to, about taking responsibility for ourselves. Because as soon as somebody else takes a decision on you, you're not responsible. You're not accountable. This is Chris Becker. I mean, he's the guy that's initiated. I'm giving some examples of South Africans. South Africans who have made a massive difference in this world. And he's one of, I mean, the fact that he's created so much value back into South Africa by timing the market, not only for his shareholders, but it's come back into South Africa. It's less than a kilometer away of your NASPAS headquarters. And I mean, what he's done is nothing short of absolutely astronomical. Tencent is growing, and I can tell you what, it's going to be bigger than Google in 10 years' time. I can tell you, Tencent's going to be huge. And it's a South African company that's backing it. Not an American, and also with the Chinese, of course. They're very clever at using the local knowledge. And Scott has talked a lot about using the partners when you go into a new country for real estate. And if that is true, it's exactly the same for business. Exactly the same. Then we've got Mark Shuttleworth. And I mean, he doesn't need much introduction. But the things that he's done in space and you know, that kind of thing and the initiatives that he's done, even though he's left the country. And Elon Musk, and I mean, he has a dream to get to Mars. <laughs> and the things that he's done with Tesla and uh, the speed train and everything that he's done is nothing short. And these are South Africans. They're South African guys that are making an impact in the world, in the world, on the global stage. And, you know, and we don't say we have to be those people. We don't have to be a Chris Becker or Elon Musk or whatever. All of them are multi, multi billionaires, not millionaires, billionaires, all of them. And it's just because what they're doing and what they identify a trend and they run with it and they run really hard. Here's a guy, Sia Zuzza. Clem Santa talks about this guy a hell of a lot. Now, Sia Zuzza is quite nothing short of astronomical. He got brought up in Antarctica in his London. He had nothing. He had nothing. He had a dream that he wanted to go to Jupiter. <laughs> I mean, he lived in a township in a shack. And he, he started you know, working and experimenting with chemicals and blew up a few times and and uh, eventually, he found, he managed to make rocket fuel. And he entered in a local science fair, and he won it. He then entered into an international engineering and, uh, and science fair in Albuquerque, America, with 1,500 entries of 52 countries. And guess what? He won. He then got offered a Harvard graduate scholarship. I mean, here's a guy who's had nothing, came from a background, and he just had a dream. His dream was, I want to go to Jupiter. So this is the big thing. So you know Nelson Mandela, and you know this is not the country that he would have wanted that we see it right now. And this whole education thing that we've got, I mean, he's our inspiration. He's my inspiration. And he says there, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Now, I'm not saying we're all going to have to go back to school and university and all these different things. You don't have to do that. Because some people are oh, all for that and whatever. But you know, there's these kind of events that you can pick up that information. There's people out there that can help you to take you to the next level, who have achieved that kind of success. And it can give you that, 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 that inspiration, that dream that, of what you would like to achieve, like Sia Zuzza did. He got offered a Harvard graduate scholarship. He then got offered a job with NASA. He turned it down. You know why? He said he wants to build a business in South Africa. I mean, isn't that an astronomical decision for, for somebody who's achieved just so much in this world? So, in closing, I want to ask you, what is your dream? In your particular business, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And you know, I just want you to think a little bit about that. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're working for a company or whatever, what kind of initiative can you make to make a real difference in the world, given that I've just given that whole scenario of what's actually happening in the world? Because it takes people like yourselves to step up to the plate 
and to be able to take those decisions like a Sia Zuzza did, like a Chris Becker did, like an Elon Musk, all the normal people, Mark Shuttleworth, they all found their, their invention, they found their little dream, and they started. So whatever it is, I just want to encourage you to find your dream. On that note, thank you very much.